Welcome to White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini pod. Delivered in short doses, this mini podcast features informal, on topic discussions with in house experts, outside counsel, and other thought leaders on a wide array of cutting edge and practical white collar and compliance topics. Visit PerkinsCoie.com for more information on our nationally ranked white collar and investigations practice. In this episode of White Collar Briefly, Perkins partners Gina LaMonica and Karen Trombino discuss the role of artificial intelligence in anti-bribery and anti-corruption compliance programs. Our guest, Megan Zwiebel from the Anti-Corruption Report, joins us to discuss her research into the use of AI in compliance programs, including trends in AI-based compliance, steps companies can take to utilize AI in their compliance programs, and how regulators view the use of data and artificial intelligence in compliance programs. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Perkins Cooey LLP and should not be considered legal advice. Hello and welcome to the White Collar Briefly podcast. I'm Gina LaMonica from Perkins Cooey. Joining me today is my partner from the Perkins Cooey White Collar and Investigations Group in Chicago, Karen Trombino. Hi, Gina. Thanks for having me. Very interesting discussion lined up today with Megan Zwiebel, Senior Editor at the Anti-Corruption Report. Hi, Megan. Hi, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about your organization and your work there? Sure. The Anti-Corruption Report is an online publication focused on giving actionable insights to in-house compliance professionals and the people who advise them about all things corruption, including compliance, which has grown and grown to encompass a whole lot of things, including what we're talking about today. And how long have you been with the Anti-Corruption Report? I've been there for about five and a half years. I was in private practice for about eight and a half years uh, before that. So you're recovering from the private practice work still, huh? Very much so. <laughs> Okay. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us, Megan. And I think Karen's going to kick us off with a little bit of background on on your work and uh, artificial intelligence for anti-corruption compliance. Thanks, Gina. So, M- Megan, we understand you've been working on a, a several part series focusing on artificial intelligence for anti-corruption compliance, which is obviously, if not a hot, the hottest topic in anti-corruption compliance right now. Can you tell us a little bit just on how you got started on that topic? Yeah, and I, it's very much just what you said. It's one of the hottest topics out there. It comes up, you could play a really terrible drinking game at any compliance conference <laughs> for every time some for some every time someone mentions artificial intelligence or machine learning. But what I was noticing is that the term was being thrown around a lot, but there was not a lot of rigor around the way people were using that term. And I think there was also not um, a lot of consensus about everyone, what everyone was talking about. Some people were talking about it with a lot of knowledge and a lot of data science background. And other people were really thinking about it in terms of, you know, Star Trek and Steven Spielberg movies. And so I really wanted to dig into that and get into the rigor, but also take a step back and give people a chance to understand the basics, not assume that everyone knew what everyone else was talking about already. So essentially create a common lexicon so we could all talk about it at the same level and then dig deeper and really understand how to use these powerful tools for compliance. I mean, when roughly do you think was that tipping point when you started hearing more and more, this becoming kind of the topic among compliance professionals? It's about really been in the last like three or so years. I wrote a detailed series, I think three years ago, that was about measuring compliance. And that felt like that was the hot topic then. It was when Hoi Chen was at the DOJ and she was talking about how the importance of data and compliance programs. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, data. And they're talking about data all the time. And then like, it felt like everyone got really done with that conversation very quickly and moved immediately <laughs> on to artificial intelligence. And I was like, I don't think you guys all learned how to do this this quickly. <laughs> you know, my article series was good, but it was not that good. And so um, <laughs> it was this like very quick leap over a focus on data to jumping ahead to thinking about even more advanced solutions. And I would say that would be in the last two to three years. So, Megan, in terms of the series you've been working on and just kind of your your own research on this topic, who are the folks that you've been reaching out to in the industry? 
Yeah. So there's a couple of leaders in the industry for sure. Interestingly, the people I have found the most helpful to talk to are in-house people. I've subsequently talked to some other people at, at, vendor, at different vendors who have some really unique insights and, and are doing unique things in this space as well. Yeah. I think Gina and I are really interested in talking to you more kind of about not just the leaders in this space, but kind of where you see the landscape moving for folks who aren't yet in it and some of the, maybe the barriers to entry for, you know, that people perceived or not perceived or, you know, perceived or real or, but before we get there, I think it would be helpful if you wouldn't mind just kind of breaking down some basics for us in terms of, you know, I know you get into this in some of your pieces, but you know, what is the difference between AI machine learning and data analytics and how are those terms either used interchangeably or confused for one another? Yeah. And it's, this is really, cause it's difficult to untangle and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and like trying to be creative and how to describe it. And it's still a difficult thing, but I think the, the best place to start is with sort of the funny assumptions that people have when you're, ter- you're the first place you start is artificial intelligence. And for most people, like I said, that's science fiction. And in some ways that's right right? Like, it's not wrong to think of artificial intelligence as like data on Star Trek, right? Like, that is a form of artificial intelligence. And that is maybe where we're going to in a very, very long time. So you can't write that out of the definition, but it's not the whole definition. And the way that I've heard it broken down that I thought was most helpful is that that kind of artificial intelligence, that that sci-fi version is general artificial intelligence, right? Which means that you have a system that can really function on its own, that can have any situation thrown at it and figure things out like a robot, right? Like an android. We don't have that. That does not exist yet. That is still science fiction, but it's good to sort of define what that is and then put it off to the side. Then what we do have, though, is narrow artificial intelligence, which is artificial intelligence limited to very specific tasks. And and then within narrow artificial intelligence is where the whole rest of the discussion has to happen because general artificial intelligence is not something we have right now. And then the other term that gets used a lot sort of interchangeably with artificial intelligence is machine learning. And I think for a lot of these discussions in the compliance space, it's actually not wrong to use them interchangeably. It's they they essentially are doing the same thing. And so I think that's okay. But they are like AI encompasses that bigger section of things. It's a broader term that pulls in lots of other stuff. Whereas machine learning is talking about sort of the narrow, you know, ability of a computer or a computer program to improve through experience, which is essentially that's what it means. It's it's a it's a computer algorithm that can learn, right? And so I think that's sort of the basics to 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 get the the hang of. And you might have seen in my writing about this, one of the things I've really latched onto is a really elaborate and possibly ridiculous, but I find very helpful analogy talking about baking. And for me, it's the, I was thinking about this because I was like, how can I stretch this analogy as far as possible? But I think it's helpful is that AI is the phrase baking, right? Which encompasses everything you could bake, right? Whereas machine learning is like a tiny subset. It would be like just cakes, right? It's just how to make cakes. It's just this one set of things. And I think that that's a good way of thinking. And so it's not wrong when you're talking about baking a cake. Like it's not cake baking specifically, it's baking too. You can talk about both of those things at the same time, but it is important to sort of keep in the back of your mind that AI is broader and machine learning is more narrow. Yeah. No, I think that that's a useful analogy and I don't think it's tortured at all. <laughs> Just wait, I got more. <laughs> Bring it on. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, and that's a helpful, I think the analogy and the overlay that you've provided is providing helpful context. And if we could, we'd like to segue a little bit into practically how this works. And so maybe in the vein of the overused baking analogy, it seems that the first step should be to gather your ingredients. And here we're talking about what 
various data uh, sets you have, how they're organized, how they're stored, and how they might be used for an analysis for anti-corruption and compliance purposes. And so what are you seeing there in terms of companies, you know, that are looking to engage in this type of artificial intelligence for compliance programs? What are you seeing in terms of how they approach their data sets? And I think that's a, like the, the key question, actually, is how they approach their data sets. It really determines how everything else goes. Companies that tends to their data, I think it was um, Zachary Coseglia at Ropes and Gray said, who, who nourish their data, those are the companies that are going to be successful going forward. That is not necessarily all companies. <laughs> I think that that is actually a really challenging step for a lot of companies is it is not easy to find out what data you have, find out where it is, find out what systems it's housed in, figure out who owns that data and what they know about it, and then getting it all into one place and then getting it to all harmonize and talk to each other is like huge. That's like a gigantic task in and of itself. And it's really sort of the first step in the process. And for many companies, it might be the last step for right now, because like, it's, it's too much. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be time consuming. And it's really worthwhile to focus on. But it means they might be not doing the fun sci fi stuff for a very, very long time, because it's they have to to get their data in order. They have to open up the pantry, right? Here's my, here's my now. You have to open up the pantry and see what you have, get it organized, figure it out, and make sure you like have a good inventory, you know where things are. That's really an important step. And it's, I think, one that people really want to skip because it's not that fun, you know? It's really not that fun, right? Cleaning the kitchen before baking is not what you want to do, right? You want to jump in and make the pretty cake, but you have to make sure that everything's in order first. And I think that that's really the pain point for a lot of companies. Yeah, and I think, you know, to put a finer point on it, when we're talking about the data that's out there, what we often want to analyze in terms of anti-corruption compliance or otherwise is key metrics, sales information, payments going to third-party vendors, expense reimbursements. And some of those, you know, based on our experience, are already in some kind of automated system for larger companies in particular. But, you know, I think, Megan, like you said, the challenge is how do we get that to talk to each other, to aggregate it, to put it in a spot where, you know, it can be analyzed for red flags above and beyond maybe what's even happening on the first level. And have you have you talked to or heard any response from the people that you've been dealing with in terms of, you know, is that something that you approach through a vendor or internally or maybe both? I think it really depends on the company. I think there's there are some companies who are set up for data that might not be true in other industries and in, in other companies that it, it just might not be part of the company's DNA to, to have that stuff e easily accessible. So I think it depends on the company. I have definitely talked to people at companies who are doing really great things in compliance and are really committed and trying. And I'm like, so what are you doing with that data? And they're like, Oh my God, we're so tired. This is, this is all we can handle. We got it all into a T and E system. What more do you want from us? <laughs> You know, and so I think it really depends on the company. I think it's something that most companies are aware of now and are aiming towards, but might not have the resources to be doing as well as maybe they would like to. Yeah. And I think before we started, we were discussing, you know, even at a rudimentary level, how AI might be incorporated into something like T&E that you just mentioned. And if you've ever submitted an expense report on Concur or another system and had it rejected due to missing data, missing support, or, you know, a, a date conflicting, I think that that's a, an early stage AI process you know, that goes towards what you're doing. But when we start talking about integrating it in machine learning, it seems like it could be a very expensive and time consuming process that, you know, the price of entry may be too much for certain companies. And it, you know, it may not be reasonable to expect, given the size. Yeah, it's an extreme, it feels like an extremely daunting first, st first step, 
you know, like you said, Megan, it's like, it's almost like the most difficult piece is the first piece you have to tackle. And I could see so many companies looking at the potential work and cost involved with even just this data collection exercise and being like, we can't, you know, how, how does this just, how are we going to justify this in terms of like a return on investment? I think that's, I mean, I'm, I'm really interested to see kind of how you're setting aside, you know, the huge tech companies and, you know, companies that may have already been in the crosshairs of enforcement action. So they essentially have to do this. You know, the other ones who kind of just want to be, you know, developing a more nimble compliance program. You know, how, how do you start that first bite on something that's enormous? And then how, how can internal stakeholders make the case that this is something that's going to pay for itself, essentially? And I think that was one of the interesting conversations I had. I had a couple of interesting conversations is to let that actually be one of your starting points is how can we quickly make this valuable to the company? And the thing is, there are ways. There definitely are ways is but you have to start small, right? Is you can't. If you want to go for the moonshot, you're not going to see a return on investment very quickly. But if you're like, I want to make our T&E system 10% more efficient, right? If that's your modest goal, you can do that. And that's a really provable return on investment. In a year, you will be able to go back to your board and be like, look at, I saved you this much money. Like I exactly this much money. I did it. And making that sort of a focus ahead of time and choosing your projects based on being able to show return out of investment is a really good strategy is it might in the long run get you there faster to start small prove concept and value and then get more buy-in incrementally and grow it that way is a, is a strategy that might make sense for some companies that are feeling or, or compliance programs that are feeling a little overwhelmed and like they're not going to be able to achieve any goals. It's start smaller, start as small as you can, start tiny and then show how good it is and build from there. So the next kind of phase in the cooking analogy is, you know, we have our ingredients. What do we do with them? What's the recipe? And, and, and it sounds like that's kind of the second component of, what we're talking about here in terms of how do you analyze the data? And is there a, a useful way you, you think about breaking that down, that concept down, Megan? I mean, it's, I think that is the hard part and that's when you need experts, right? Is it, that's a hard for, part for compliance people and lawyers, right? Is there is no way that we are going to sit down and write an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm for our TAD program. And so you have to call in outside help that can do that end of things. You need software engineers and you need data scientists. And so I think that that's really, for me and the way I think about it is like the next step is building a team that goes beyond the people in the compliance and legal department because they cannot do it alone. And then it's actually, I think in some ways that's really easy then for the compliance people is you find great people to work with and answer their questions, frame your question really intelligently, I think, maybe start really small and tiny and narrow, get your data all in one place, and then hand it off to the software. Engineer. <laughs> um, and so that part, I think, shouldn't be that scary, actually, because that is what money is for, <laughs> right? That's what investment is for. That is what for people with software engineering degrees are for, is they know how to solve those problems. And it's, I, I love situations where you can f- can find someone with expertise and let them fix a problem for you and i think this is one of those places is like d- don't worry about writing the algorithm you're not going to write the algorithm <laughs> someone else is going to do it and they and they should they will do it better than you and that's a that's a great thing but focus on finding good people to work with and making sure those good people have all the resources they need to do a good job yeah and it- in terms of kind of, and you know, you talked before about one one good way to perhaps begin down this road is to come with this, come up with a small but achievable kind of goal. I mean, have you seen like a, a company start with a small, discrete kind of goal for AI? And if so, what is kind of the lifespan of you know? Is it is it a year? Is it does it tend to be like a year long endeavor? Is it short shorter than that? I mean, the the time frames I've been given are that like, for, if you're going to break down the process, the actual like 
building of the model from the point that you're, you have your data in order, you're handing it off. And then, so there's programming, pro- programming a model. And then when you're dealing with machine learning, you actually have to teach it, right? So you have to feed data into it get results, feed it back, get more results, feed it back. And that process can take six months to a year if you're doing it carefully. And so what I like about that is like, it's, it's this great timeframe of like long, but not impossibly long, right? Like, and so, and I I don't think I I wouldn't stand by a year, but I think the idea is that people should have in their minds that it will take many months but months, not many, many years, many, many months, and sort of keep it in that in-between time frame of is you will have something viable within a year or two. You will not have something viable within a few months. Gina, did you want to talk a little bit about al- algorithms and the type of algorithms that that we see being utilized in the compliance, in the anti-corruption compliance space? Yeah, I think some of it, I mean, and these are, I think, traditional things that we've gotten. We know our risks are red flags and it's a matter of automating the process to locate those types of transactions or red flags and raise them to, you know, at least earlier stages to human beings to review um, to make sure that it's a, you know, a, a true hit and or if it's, you know, a false positive. But I think that, you know, some of the basic mechanisms that are in place right now are to flag round number transactions, which usually, you know, going through a system that would be a very rare occurrence to flag if a purchase order date is predates the the invoice or, you know, certain, like we talked about earlier, travel and entertainment expenses that are lacking in some metric or raise another red flag that it's been programmed to slot as something that needs to be reviewed further before it can be approved. And I think, Megan, what we're talking about then is those are like the training wheels and the, the goal is to build on that and automate it even more, make your red flag detection system a little bit more fine-tuned and a little bit smarter as time goes on and it gets more data and can analyze it. And I think that's kind of when you move into the machine learning portion of this. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I, I think one of the ways that companies can sort of add or or start on an AI journey like in very small steps is to take analytics and algorithms that they already have in their program and work with software engineers and data scientists to essentially just take them that one step further with a machine learning algorithm version of it so that it is improving automatically rather than having to have... So the way it can work is you have, let's say, a T&E algorithm, right, that flags transactions that are round numbers above a certain threshold from a certain geography. And you're, you're finding all of a sudden that that's, it's getting bumped up to reviewers, the reviewers are getting a lot of false positives. So the reviewers are like, there's something wrong, tweak this, take it down to this threshold, but lift, you know, make it a, a narrow geography, right? So they're automatically changing the dials on that out the step like the the tiny iterative step up from that would be instead to have the algorithm be able to change those dials itself and that's machine learning is that the algorithm itself is like i'm getting you're saying no too many times what happens if i change this number if change this threshold and bring it down 10 percent? i'm getting fewer negatives like the the model is doing that that part of it rather than having human reviewers do it. And that's like a tiny little iterative step towards it, towards machine learning and AI that companies can do relatively easily once they have a good system in place, once they've done all that human work of getting like, for instance, a T&E algorithm up and running. Right. And I think that, you know, you touch on this in your written pieces as well, but that portion of your compliance program is constantly going to be ongoing and tweaking. You know, I think that's the goal is that it's constantly getting better as new and different data comes in. But you always have to be keeping an eye on it. You can't just set it and forget it because, you know, there will come a point where if there is something calibrated in the wrong direction or otherwise, you will be expected to have been monitoring your automated compliance program, you know, whatever, whatever portion of your compliance program is reliant on AI or machine learning. 
So it, it, we talked about a time frame, six months to a year, but I think this third step is hopefully an ongoing process where, you know, a company just keeps getting better and more efficient at it. Right. And I think that's maybe a key thing to understand about what AI is, is it is not in a vacuum. It needs human feedback and input forever, right? Like, like it, forever. It can't, it can't gather its own data about the real world, right? You have to provide it with data and feedback. And part of the data you're going to feed into it going forward is whether a red flag was a false positive or not, and or whether it was a true positive. And that there has to be that human interaction going forward. And maybe that's something that's really key to underscore for companies is like, this is not something that you set up and never look at your compliance program again, because it's a robot and works. It's something, it's a tool that still needs human input going forward to continue to work and to continue to improve. And I think the analogy there is in the past, you know, when we've counseled companies on uh, and we've heard from government regulators on what your compliance program should look like, there was the um, cliche paper tiger that it, your compliance program looked good on paper, but how is it actually being implemented and is it effective? And I think the paper tiger analogy is is it transferable in some respects to AI and machine learning in that, you know, you can't just have good metrics on paper. You have to show that you've been making sure that it's effective and that you've implemented it in a manner where, you know, there are not things that fall through the cracks because no one was, you know, human, no compliance personnel was keeping an eye on it. Karen, other big picture thoughts, questions on the AI development that you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a follow on, Gina, to what you just kind of articulated, which is I the question I keep on coming to is when when are we going to hit that point when companies are expected to have like any in the regulators view the a baseline assumption is going to be that a an effective compliant a reasonable and effective compliance program has an AI component to it. And I think I mean, I think we're a ways off. Obviously, we're not there yet. And I think it's going to start with the big companies because the expectations tend to be higher for large multinational companies. But I'm curious, Megan, where you see that in terms of timeline. You know, how, how many years off are we from the FCC and DOJ saying you have a compliance program, but you, you're not doing anything with AI? That's not, you know, that's, that's just not meeting our baseline threshold for what we would expect a company of your size and activity to be doing. So when it comes to DOJ and SEC expectations, I think my impression is that they're fairly reasonable and and maybe even more so than reasonable is that they're outcome focused, right? Is that I don't know that they care so much how you get there as long as you get there, as long as you have a compliance program that is fit for purpose and is to to a reasonable extent preventing issues. And so I think it's unlikely that anytime in the next five years, the DOJ is going to look at your program and be like, you don't have an AI, forget it. Like, I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think if there was an easy fix, right, if, if you have, you know, a data, you have your data all cleaned up, it's it's all done, your TNA, your TDs all in one place, and then you didn't put, didn't have any algorithms combing through that data, looking for things, the DOJ is going to be like, why didn't you do this simple thing? Like, I know you could do this. This I, I've seen many other companies doing this. Why aren't you doing that? So I, I think there's a balance there. I don't think that, that AI is going to become like an immediate, you know, off on. But I do think it's something they're aware of. And that if it was an easy fix that a company sort of just didn't do, that that's going to be a problem. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I was struck. Uh, uh, there was a study a year ago that said it was actually a really small percentage of companies. It was uh, a survey was done by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, and it said only thirteen percent of companies surveyed use artificial intelligence or machine learning to fight fraud. So it, it does seem like there is a a very <laughs> there's a long road to go, but this, there's obviously a lot of exciting stuff happening within you know small pockets here. Yeah, and I think that that number doesn't surprise me at all. And I would note that that's for fraud, which is 
so much easier to apply machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence to. Anti-corruption is uniquely hard. There's a lot of data out there already about fraud. Uh, it happens like when you're talking about credit card fraud and, and transaction fraud, it happens much more frequently than a true bribe happens. So you have way more data to work with to build a smart machine learning model. Anti-corruption is very hard. It does not happen that often. If a company were to see thousands of true positive uh, corruption, red, red flags, just red flags, not even true corruption in a year, that would be a ton and building a machine learning model off of a thousand data points is not easy. You're not going to get a very predictive model off of that small data. And in an upcoming article, I'll be talking about just that problem about, you know, why anti-corruption compliance is a uniquely difficult place to be applying these tools and some workarounds that companies can use to do so. Are there other you know, subject areas outside of anti-corruption compliance where you think there's been more kind of sophisticated, you know, movement towards AI? I mean, like it's fraud definitely jumps out is one of the things like everyone was like, well, in fraud, you can do this. It's because the, the credit card companies in particular have been studying it for so long. They have so much data on it. And, and we know it, we see it all the time. How often have you gotten a fraud alert? Because right? <laughs> but it, it's really so smart. <laughs> I got shut right? down. Right. Or, but there was also, right, exactly. It's a misfire, but it's an interesting misfire where like, I realized they were miscoding a butcher shop I went to as a package store that was suspect. And so I'd go to the wine shop and the butcher shop, but it was getting coded as like, (laughs) as like alcohol purchase and package shop. And so it came up as fraudulent, right? And so first of all, it's really smart to put those two together that that's like a fraudulent pair of transactions to, to, to flag that. But also really interesting that it was totally wrong because of the way they were just miscoding those businesses. So I think fraud is a place where it's actually much more advanced. And it, whereas corruption is like way behind that but there's all sorts of places like we don't even realize where ai exists in our life like do you talk to text on your phone that's all artificial intelligence right all of the the natural language processing that makes like all those little things in our lives easy it's it's everywhere it's just very it's much smaller you know less obvious than i think we expect it to be i mean you mentioned you're working on a another piece to this series of articles that you've been publishing so far. So can you give us a little preview as to what your next piece is going to be focusing on in this area? Yeah, like I said, the next piece is going to be focusing on the unique challenges of applying AI in the anti-corruption space and ways that companies have been or can be perhaps aspirationally in the future address those problems. And because I do think that part of the disconnect when people are talking about this, at least in my world, which is the anti-corruption world, is that it is something that is out there and available, but really hard in this particular space. And I sort of wanted to unpack that uh, a little bit more so that companies that feel like maybe they're lagging behind understand why they are lagging behind is that it's not because you're doing it wrong. It's because it's really hard. Well, uh, you know, thank you again. I found your pieces to be very insightful and really helpful in getting this conversation started and understanding that, you know, the benefits, but also the challenges for companies that want to approach this into their compliance program. And the last thing is I want to give you a chance to, t- I don't think we've told uh, our listeners where they can find your your work. Is anticorruption.com the best it is. avenue? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, it's anti-corruption.com, the anti-corruption report. And you can find me at megan.swibel at accurus.com. Accurus is our uh, parent company. If you have any uh, thoughts or questions you'd like to share, and if you have unique insights on how hard anti-corruption AI is, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And you can find me on LinkedIn too, uh, which is how Gina found me, in fact. <laughs> so. And I would encourage our listeners to find you and follow you on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I, I enjoyed the kind of live updates, <laughs> live messaging that you did uh, during one of the la- most recent uh, FCPA anti-corruption conferences. And so I, I appreciate the work that you're doing. And, and I think that, again, your work has been helpful and insightful. So thank you for your contributions in this area as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Megan. It was great to meet you. Yeah, great to meet you guys too. This concludes this episode of White Collar Briefly. Please visit whitecollarbriefly.com where you can subscribe to our blog and find additional updates on current white collar and compliance topics. White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini pod, copyright 2020 by Perkins Coie LLP. Thank you for listening.